to you. Um, so we have now Marissa Duris and Debbie Kilroy from Sisters Inside. Please state your names and your organisation you're from for the purpose of the video. Thank sure. you. Before you begin. Uh, Debbie Kilroy, CEO of Sisters Inside. And I'm Marissa Duris, Policy Officer at Sisters Inside. Thank you. Um, so I've just got some opening remarks and then we can open up the questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to acknowledge traditional owners of the land in which we meet the Turrbal and Yuggera people and pay our respects to Elders past and present. We acknowledge the continuing sovereignty of all First Nations people in struggles for justice. The extreme imprisonment rates of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are the direct result of the ongoing colonisation of this country. Poverty, poor health, family separation and premature death are the legacies of carceral colonial state for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, families and communities. We must dismantle this state if we want to support futures for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls. As you know, Sisters Inside is an independent community organisation that advocates for the collective human rights of women in prison and provides services to support women and their families. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Sisters Inside. The organisation started when I left prison in 1992. We've been supporting women in prison for over 25 years. Our comments today reflect both our direct experience supporting women in prison every day, as well as our policy and legislative research on issues that affect criminalised and imprisoned women and girls. This inquiry represents a real opportunity for change, but the starting point for change must be imagining abolition, a world without prisons, Queensland without prisons. To actually change the outcomes for the most marginalised women and girls, the Queensland Government must start imagining abolition and must implement policies that work towards this goal. I know abolition is not something I will see in my lifetime, but abolition is not only about the end goal, it is about the praxis and policy. When we talk about imagining abolition, we are acknowledging that achieving abolition through decarceration will be a process and it will require imagination, creativity and courageous leadership. In fact, all policy uh, processes require imagination, the ability to imagine a different future. Abolitionist thinking requires us to be clear about whose future and whose safety we're planning for and what patterns of violence are reproduced if we keep the same old institutions and the same old policy settings. The reality is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women experience the most harm within the current system. In our view, therefore, the needs and priorities of criminalised Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and their children must be at the centre of all policies that seek to fundamentally transform the criminal legal system. As of March 31st, 2019, there were 906 women in Queensland prisons, comprising 326 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and 580 uh, non-Indigenous women. Overall, almost 40% of women were on remand. However, the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women on remand is much higher, 44% compared to 34% of non-Indigenous women. In contrast, the proportion of men on remand was around 31% for both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and non-Indigenous men. In our experience, the main drivers of remand, particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, are poverty, homelessness and lack of affordable housing, lack of healthcare services, including drug rehabilitation and uh, complexities within the legal systems. Prison itself is criminogenic. It re-traumatises women, it entrenches women in poor health, it separates women from their children and families and it ultimately undermines community safety. The Commission's draft report found that at the current rate of growth, the Queensland Government would be required to spend up to $6.5 billion on building new prisons by 2025. This money will be wasted on prisons, imprisonment and criminalisation are failed policies. The only ones that will benefit from this type of funding by 2025 will be the prison industry and the welfare industry. The women will not benefit from this. The Queensland Government must start imagining abolition and implementing decarceration poli policies that reduce the numbers of women in prison and in the criminal legal system. Building more prisons is not the investment needed and if we continue to build prisons we will see the same old, same old and as I always say, nothing changes if nothing changes. So I want to talk about imagining abolition and what needs to change for women in Queensland. Sisters Inside has identified three priority areas for change to talk about today. The first is address the housing affordability crisis. Housing is an enormous gap in the Commissioner's draft report. Commission's last report, sorry, not the Commissioner's. Yeah. 
Um, lack of safe, affordable and stable housing is a national issue. It is a known issue, but governments continue to drag their feet and maintain their silence on this issue. Housing is complicated by lack of adequate uh, income support through Centrelink as well as a lack of essential services or the increasingly punitive operation of essential services that support people to stay in housing. This week, Anglicare released their National Rental Affordable Snapshot. The snapshot surveyed over 69,000 rental listings across Australia, advertise on realestate.com. It found that 317 rentals were affordable for a single person on the disability pension. 317 out of 69,000. 75 rentals were affordable for a single parent with one child on Newstart. Two rentals were affordable for a single person in a property or share house on Newstart. One rental was affordable for a single person in a property or share house on Youth Allowance. And no rentals, no, zero, zip, nothing, was affordable for a single person on Newstart or Youth Allowance in any major city or regional centre. Gobsmacking, really, isn't it? For most women exiting prison, this means there is no affordable housing available prior to being criminalised if they're homeless on the street and most definitely when they're released from prison. The Commission's report, final report, cannot be silent on this issue and it can't be a recommendation like other inquiries to set up an internal group of bureaucrats to discuss the issue. There is enough discussion, there is enough evidence, not only here in this jurisdiction or in this country, but around the world about the issue of, issue of affordable housing for marginalised and disadvantaged people to end poverty and ensure that affordable housing is there for people to be released from prison. So I urge you, strongly urge you, to make a recommendation that is so strong that the government cannot remain silent on this any longer. The $6.5 by 2025 would be a place to put, spend that money. There are particular issues with women who are eligible for disability support pension as well, due to changes in Centrelink policy brought in by the Turnbull government. People on the disability support pension who remain in prison for longer than 13 weeks are cut off the pension um, and must reapply once they are released from prison. This process is a, uh, very time consuming and clearly limits people's housing options. Housing issues have an especially harsh impact on women with complex health needs, meaning mental health issues, substance use issues and disability. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are particularly overrepresented in this group and criminal histories that reflect the trauma they have experienced often from childhood. When we think about our work alongside these women, it is an absolute myth that imprisonment prevents crime and keeps the community safer. Who is concerned with their, with their safety, the women's safety? Women continue to be criminalised in prison for offences against corrective services officers or damage to prison property. They are churned through the criminal legal system because of prison. As a result of these charges, women's accommodation op offers, uh, options become even more limited. Most mainstream or supported services will, will reject women with criminal histories that show violence in their criminal history. Some services do not accept women directly from prison at all. The result is that women either access substandard and or short-term accommodation or they remain in prison. Sisters Inside supports women with referrals to um, supported accommodation services or rehabilitation services, but we often find that it is easier to get women out of prison initially through short-term accommodation. Accommodation is uh, the greatest brokerage cost across all of our programs at Sisters Inside. In 2016-17, we spent $32,286.61 on accommodation for women. In 17-18, this figure rose to $75,558.43, which reflects an increase in our funding, but also what we are able to do for women and girls. In this financial year, we've spent, to date, $56,577.88 on accommodation for women being released from prison. Uh, we are not economists, but the numbers seem pretty clear in favour of supporting women with housing um, instead of imprisonment. On average, it costs $107,000 um, to keep a woman in prison for one year. In contrast, based on rental costs of $350 per week, it would cost $18,200 to fully subsidise a woman's rent for one year. The Queensland Government must expand its housing program, including by building, uh, or acquiring more public housing and or subsidising rents in the private rental market. 
Sisters Inside does not support uh, housing accommodation um, blocks like, um, for example, Common Ground, where everybody's dumped in together. It just doesn't yeah. work for women. They're turned away um, time and time again, and women won't go into those types of properties because of the violence that will be perpetrated against them. Um, there are some women in prison who may already have public housing, um, and in our experience, women are often at risk of losing this housing without adequate um, advocacy support, often due to a lack of understanding of the legal system. For example, the Department of Housing is simply given information about a woman's full-time release date, and on this basis, they often write to the women in prison to end their ten tenancies, rather than exploring options for release from prison, either through bail or parole. Serious economic analysis of public housing versus imprisonment is required if we are going to reduce the number of women entering and returning to the prison system. Housing issues also intersect with health care. Many women would like to access drug rehabilitation services and or mental health services. If a woman is in prison, it is very difficult for her to be referred directly to rehabilitation. Unless women are seriously unwell, women are routinely turned away from mental health services even when they seek support. On the other hand, there are other women with serious mental health issues who are effectively entrenched in the inpatient mental health system and those women are not consistently supported to transition from the hospital system to the community with supported housing or access services such as NDIS. The NDIS has uh, exacerbated these issues by turning disability services into a market. It has allowed providers to withdraw support for women who become too difficult. Additionally, because the NDIS does not explicitly fund housing, the cost for women to access specialist services remain prohibitively expensive if they have been cut off the disability support pension due to their imprisonment. Two, reduce the scope of criminal law legislatively and in practice. For women with complex health needs, such as mental health issues, substance use and or disability, the criminal legal system undermines the success of health responses. It has become the default response to address social problems, especially in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls. Sisters and Side strongly supports reducing the scope of the criminal legal system, both through decriminalising certain offences as well as through pre-charge diversionary options. The following offences, um, and the list is not exhausted, could be yeah. decriminalised. Begging, fair evasion, public nuisance, public drunkenness, urinating in public, possessing drugs, utensils or used syringes that uh, for, were for personal use, uh, breach of bail conditions and fail to appear should also be decriminalised. Alternatively, sentences for failure to appear must not be cumulative on other sentences. Mandatory sentences for driving and licence offences must also be reviewed. Charging practices for stealing and new tags must be clarified. Women must not be charged with stealing if it is possible to charge with the lesser offence of UTAG. Greater diversionary options must be available for women. The cost of punishing women for UTAG or stealing where the victim is a huge company, for example, Coles, Woolworths, Kmart, um, it's likely uh, much greater than any harm caused. Women are being imprisoned for stealing and or fraud charges that involve these large companies. There's a woman in prison today um, that was sentenced to three months for stealing baby formula. Pre-charge diversionary options such as adult cautioning, police custody notification services and police referral to community organisations would assist fewer women to be criminalised. There must be a new approach to domestic and family violence, especially for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. The current legislation excessively punishes women and does not support genuine identification of the primary perpetrator of violence. And zero tolerance policies have failed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women again and again and again. We are also concerned about the impact of zero tolerance language shaping policy in other areas. For example, violence against paramedics and health workers and harm to children. When we raise this concern, we are not trying to minimise the seriousness of these issues and the seriousness of violence. However, in our view, expanding the criminal law is not the appropriate response to these issues. This week, the Queensland Government actually passed legislation to expand the definition of murder. We are seriously concerned about the flow on consequences of this change for women, particularly women who are victims of domestic and family violence, who actually try to defend themselves in those situations.
In circumstances where the serious violent offence regime could have been addressed, the government instead decided to change the definition of murder, which carries a mandatory life uh, mandatory sentence of life imprisonment. The SVO regime operates like a mandatory penalty for sentences over 10 years and CUSAC identified that it may be exerting downward pressure on head sentences for manslaughter. In our view, all mandatory sentences must be abolished. We must allow judicial officers in the court system to sentence people because they have all the material in front of them. Uh, government, uh, parliament should not be uh, introducing further or any mandatory sentencing and take away that discretion of a judicial officer. Support, uh, the third is support women to transition from prison and parole successfully. Currently there are limited options and no accountability for women to progress through the legal system or prison system. There is a serious disconnect between the bail and parole systems. Legislative barriers to release must be addressed, especially for women on parole charged with new offences or women on parole charged with offences that predate their parole orders. Women's success on bail is not taken into account in the same way as a pre-sentence custody uh, in determining a woman's sentence. Um, existing leave of absence provisions could be better used to support women to access bail or parole. Additionally, leave of absence provisions must be expanded to reintroduce, and um, this was a uh, law back in the 90s, um, resettlement leave and work release, and to remove legislative barriers to leave uh, leave of absence for women on remand who are uh, assessed as having a low security classification within the prison system. Myself, I benefited from the work release and leave of absence. So when I um, was classified low and moved to Albion or Helena Jones Community Correctional Centre, I, was, I could work from Monday to Friday. I could leave that prison, travel to Woodridge, work Monday to Friday, come back after work. Um, and then on Friday night I could leave to go home to my grandmother's to be with my children through the weekend and come back to the prison at 5pm on a Sunday afternoon. So that reintegration, slow reintegration back into the community was then easy to step into my parole um, order at time of release. But what we're actually seeing is the majority of women are being released from maximum security with no reintegration in the community. And uh, when women are released into poverty and back to homelessness, then why are we surprised that they are recriminalised and re-imprisoned? We can't really be surprised. Um, greater use of leaves of absence would support women in prison to build relationships with external uh, service providers for continuous assistance with healthcare needs. Uh, legislative and policy barriers, barriers that prevent women in prison uh, from accessing mainstream healthcare and other social services must be addressed. Advocacy support is essential to assist women to plan for their release, including housing, NDIS, Centrelink and healthcare referrals. Um, other areas that we'd like to raise for discussion with the Commission include um, net widening through community-based sentencing options such as home detention and electronic monitoring or what it's known as e-carceration. Sisters and Society does not support community-based sentencing options that expand supervision and, or monitoring for women. We are very concerned that introducing home detention and or electric monitoring as normal components of our legal system will have both social and economic costs for women and the Queensland Government. We are very cautious about the so-called risk assessment tools. These tools and frameworks has, have existed for a long time without any proven ability to improve decision making in the legal system uh, in a way that actually reduces imprisonment. Existing risk assessment tools office, often conflate need with risk in a criminal law context. Um, the outcome of this is to continue to assess Aboriginal and Torres Strait women as risky. Um, and uh, an example of that is the operation of the classification system in prison. As of 31st March 2019, according to Queensland Corrective Services Custodial Offender Snapshot, 74% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait women have a high security classification compared with 62% of non-Indigenous women. In contrast, only 15% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have a low security classification compared with 30% of non-Indigenous women. Re-entry services, or re-entry as they're uh, labelled, including service models and funding arrangements. Um, we have a unique service model for supporting criminalised and imprisoned women with demonstrated success in assisting women to reduce their contact with the criminal legal system. Sisters Inside uh, has only very recently been specifically funded as a transition service to support women in prison and after release 
uh, from Gatton. Our services are grounded in lived experience of criminalised and imprisoned women and girls, and that's why they're successful. Um, further oversight and accountability mechanism for the criminal legal system. Repeated reports have recommended independent and transparent oversight of the prison system through the implementation of the Chief Inspector. These recommendations must be implemented as a matter of urgency. They are supposedly supported by the Queensland Government but have not been implemented to date. Um, we, are also, we also support the KPIs that make the, the police and prison system accountable, um, including some of the me measures outlined in the draft recommendation of 16 in your report. Fines are an issue that must be addressed. Um, to transition to greater use of fines and the fine system must be reviewed and fines must be based on women's income and there must be accountability to ensure that women are not simply entrenched in debt to the state government. Thank you. Libby, thank you very much. There's a wide and long and deep shopping list, I guess, grounded in uh, quite some years of experience now with your organisation. Mm -hmm. A lot of that information is confronting. Mm. So I don't know how you do this every day. <laughs> Norma, do you have any questions? Yeah, I do have some questions. Okay. Um, Deb, you spoke, and thanks for the presentation, for being nice for being here, um, and for meeting with the team. I know you've met with team members prior to today. You mentioned housing quite a bit <laughs> in, in, a, in a range of things that you said, mm -hmm. um, and that the block housing is not suitable. Um, and that's good to get that message and we've heard that from other people too. What I want to know is what type of housing, so what type of housing would be suitable in terms of housing coming out, housing for transition housing, flexible flexible type housing and reintegration housing and I did go and visit Elena Jones mm. so I've seen that uh, facility but what kind of housing for a whole range of circumstances would you and your organisation see as suitable? Because we, we kind of need to get a bit of a handle on that sure. too. So over the years, because we have been around for mm. some time, we've developed our own frameworks of how to work with and for criminalised and imprisoned women. And so um, we have proposed a number of models to governments um, over the years. Um, one of them we presented uh, a few years ago, a market-led proposal around a housing model that we believe would work. Now, it wasn't um, funded and implemented as it, in its purity of our model. It shifted a bit um, at the Minister's discretion um, under this government. And so there's two different models that were um, funded out of that, a model here in South East Queensland that's not run by Sisters Inside, and it, which is very different to our model that's run in North Queensland out of our Townsville office. So what it is basically is um, a model where um, we have staff on the ground at our office in Townsville that are in the prisons every day and we um, do an assessment, if you like, um, speak to women who, because it's for women coming out on parole, which we disagree with, it should be all women coming out, but that's what the funding was for. Um, but it was to, uh, we actually seek women's eligibility um, if they can go into housing um, that we support. So how the housing is obtained is through usually the private market because there's not enough government housing. And then Queensland Housing assists financially um, for the rent so that women pay a percentage like they would in public housing for the, the private housing. Now, um, to be eligible, we go through a process of identifying the woman's needs. So it's actually driven by her needs, not by a system that's already established where she has to fit in it. Mm -hmm. So Mary may have no children and just need a studio apartment. And so that's what we look for and that's what we obtain with the support of um, Queensland Housing uh, public servants that work very closely with us. Jenny might need a three-bedroom house because she has four children who are in care. However, we've worked with child protection and they have agreed to allow Jenny to have overnights with her children if she has a three-bedroom house. So then we advocate for that and get a three-bedroom house in an area that's suitable. Some women want to move from their, you know, they used to live on one side of town, they want to go to the other side of town in a two-bedroom apartment. So that's what we do and then we broker that in. Now, then we support the women over a 12-month period to maintain that rental property and then assist them in every other way, whether it's um, 
getting their children back from child protection, whether it's getting training, getting employment, um, whatever it may be, um, reporting to parole, like so, you know, supporting them to um, be successful in their parole um, orders. And after 12 months, there's a guarantee then from Queensland Housing that they either can stay on in that property or there will be a public housing property that they can mm -hmm. move to for long term. So they actually stay in that for, for 12 months, which is, you know, quite substantial and then move on or stay in that property and it's actually working it, uh, it it's quite successful so we can do we have plenty instead of like uh, having every house out here being a prison with home detention uh, which is very dangerous for women if I can just regress to home detention because if you're a woman that goes home with a violent partner and you are being assaulted you're not going to call the police because then your home detention is at risk and you go back to prison. The other thing is the majority of women are released from prison into homelessness so they can't, won't even be able to get out of prison if they don't have a home for home detention and I don't like the idea that every home can be a prison. That The prison industry just continues to expand. So. Um, when we look at the housing, um, it's about looking at housing that's available in either the public um, scheme or the private scheme that fits women's needs. So it's actually driven by the women. It's not driven by the market as such yep. of the housing market, you know, yeah, like of government saying these are the block of units, this is where you stay yeah. and you have no choice. Yeah. With um, your housing models that you've put up before, if they are available to be provided could they be provided to the commission the funding yeah. oh the, yeah, 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 the, the market led, yes the, yeah it, cha it shifted our original um, market led proposal was a three way agreement because we we see that um, housing arrangements now in the community um, don't actually work really well because um, it, Homeless services and housing services, community housing services get funded um, and then the contract is basically between them and the woman. So, and then they have the support, but the support is always coming from a position of power over, not power with. Because if Mary hasn't paid her rent or there's a hole in the wall, then this person comes over the top and says, well, where's your rent? Why haven't you fixed the hole in the wall? Do you know what I mean? So our market-led proposal, like simplistically, was a three-way agreement. It was to um, work with Aboriginal housing organisations, Sisters Inside and the woman. So then the housing organisation can deal with the rental and any issues of the tenancy. And if there's an issue, they actually talk to us and we support yeah. Mary. And then we can resolve it instead of her being evicted. Um, what we presented to be funded is Sisters Inside has the support workers, we um, support the women and identify them to go into properties and uh, there's public servants who are allocated to that program that actually find assist finding the housing and sign off etc. So um, so the Aboriginal housing organisations were cut out of um, the model the that we put up. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, you can have... Um, yeah, that might be good. Good. That's not a problem. The other thing I just wanted, and it's probably about some, it includes housing, but comes back to women with disability. Mm. Um, and it's been raised a number of times, including when we were travelling around to other communities, that when they are cut off and somehow streamlining processes to get women back on disability services or their package. Mm -hmm. Any ideas about how that might happen in a more streamlined, faster, yeah, more efficient that, way? Yeah, sure. um, we, okay, we've got a woman that the hospital, prison hospital contacted yeah. us about, so I'll let Marissa, because Marissa worked closely with her, and she was on an NDIS package as well that got cancelled, so I'll let Marissa talk about that. Yeah, yeah. sure. I think, um, so I first start off by saying that I think there's a lot of confusion between the NDIS and the and Centrelink's disability support yes. pension, particularly yeah. even within um, kind of service providers supporting um, women in prison and criminalised women. So it's really hard trying, because they are two different processes yes. and they each have their own complexities, um, trying to kind of detangle that is tricky. So um, yeah, the best way to talk about it, I suppose, maybe is a case study or, you know, just mm -hmm. sharing sure. um, this particular woman's experience. Um, she had been um, on, the NDI on the disability support pension for quite a while um, and with the transition to the NDIS did also have quite a substantial funded package. But the issue with that was that it was only for her physical disability and didn't cover any um, psychosocial um, or other support needs in the sort of mental health, you know, in that kind of um, area. Um, 
And so the result of that um, and sort of how she came to be criminalised was that um, her, her health, her mental health and wellbeing was deteriorating. Um, and as a result of that, um, she became too difficult and providers withdrew from, in the NDIS, providers withdrew um, from offering support, which then left um, kind of no other option except for... Was it temporarily or permanently? Uh, permanently. So because it's a, there's no obligation under the NDIS to work with someone, so you can withdraw. Um, there's sort of no last resort um, provider as far as as far as I'm aware. And I know there have been, that's an issue that's been raised, but um, yeah, at this stage, I'm not aware that that's the case. Um, it, she did maintain her disability support pension payment from Centrelink, but with no one to provide the services under the NDIS package. It's effectively useless. Um, and so, yeah, we see that that contributes then to imprisonment. With the... Um, we've just recently supported her to be released from prison again. The NDIS package is able to be... She had a support coordinator, so someone who assisted um, to identify organisations to provide these actual services that are funded under the NDIS package. And so that was really good because that person was able to make arrangements to reactivate the NDIS package um, after release from prison. But because she'd been in prison longer than 13 weeks, the disability support pension through Centrelink ended. So, and because there's no, um, you know, those are both federal systems, but because there's no kind of continuity, um, she's released with the NDIS support, but lower income support, you know, just new start. So um, it does really trap people. Um, and the result of that is um, that if you don't have access to finances or an organisation that sort of understands the complexities of those things, um, then, you know, you don't necessarily have the funds to be released. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. you. Unit. Queensland House. Have you got any questions? Mm. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. No. What's, with 900 odd women in jail in Queensland at any given time, what's the unmet need out there? I know your organisation, it's purpose built, it's got a single mission and it gets on with it. And you, you know, you do it really effectively. I've been very impressed with Sister Inside. Is there an unmet need? For women in prison currently? Are you able to do everything you want to do? I, don't I, don't, I think we could um, double our organisation side, it still wouldn't meet the need. Right. And um, mm -hmm. so, you know, as a prison abolitionist organisation, um, we think and um, grapple all the time with the complex issues around what needs to happen to work towards imagining abolition in a world without prison. So, you know, we grapple with violence because we actually don't dismiss violence. It's actually a very serious issue. And so the thing is that one of the biggest issues is, you know, when we talk about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls is actually the ongoing colonisation of this country that is in the DNA of the structures and systems of government. Um, fundamentally racism. Um, so that is one of the biggest issues and we see that day in, day out when you go in the prison system. One of the other biggest issues is poverty. You know, yep. um, women are living in absolute poverty. So when you're living in poverty, um, you can't afford, and we went through what's available, which is nothing really in this country, affordable accommodation. Um, you end up on the streets. You have your children taken, so you're grief-stricken. You're a woman who's been sexually abused numerous times from a very young age into your teenage years and your adulthood, so you're dealing with that trauma. You've been in a violent relationship. Yep. You decide uh, you end up self-medicating with illegal drugs because you don't have any money to access uh, medical s services. So once you start um, self-medicating with illegal drugs, you will collide with the cops and then you're going to be criminalised and eventually imprisoned. You know, at $107,000 a year to keep a woman in prison, we could have actually, you know, all right, even from an economic point of view, don't give her the whole $107,000 a year, give her half of that. Give her $50,000 a year. And she will be able to, um, you know, the, just over 18000 be able to rent something for $350 a week, we'll be able to buy food, we'll be able to look after her children, engage them in accommodation, she can do some training, you know, for $50,000 a year is a lot of money. Yeah. But, I mean, you start to live on $260 a week is near impossible. Like, yeah, yeah I just want, would like, you know, yourselves and people that are in these buildings on this level to actually think about what it would be like to live on $260 a week. Because yeah. I know a lot of people spend $260 on a meal and wine every night of the week. So to imagine that, 
and how do you live? Well, of course you're going to collide with the police and end up criminalised and imprisoned. So poverty is a massive issue. And so we have to alleviate it in a way, the state has to in a way, because I know that Centrelink is a federal issue and they're just, <laughs> the government of the day are not going to increase, the, you know, they're very clear. Um, they don't want to increase because people, well, for whatever reasons, but anyway. Um, so we actually got to deal with it in a way, like our housing model, to subsidise, because it's actually cheaper to subsidise. It would be cheaper to pay a woman's rent for a year for just over $18,000 then put her in a prison for $107,000. Yeah, for people that haven't met your organisation, you or any of your clients, probably have a very strong view about an offender that you know they need to be locked up and keep the community safe. The minute you start to interact with people that are in the system or have been through the system, you realise what a soul-destroying place it can be. Mm. How do we change the community's perception and mind about these issues? See, I think... I was you're, 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 you're espousing a very radical... I don't think it's radical. Theology. I think yeah. it's absolute common sense. I agree with that. It, it, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, when you say abolition, people freak out. I'm like, yeah. And they go, oh my God, you're going to let all the rapists and murderers out of prison. Well, everyone has a story. Like, people don't just wake up in the morning and start killing people, right? The women who are in prison for murder is usually in the context of horrific violent relationships and have reacted. Or, uh, you know, very few have just committed random acts, you know to um, murder someone. And that's what the community jumps to. The community is not educated to understand who's in our prisons. And I spend a lot of my time, day in, day out, talking to community members, speaking at conferences, speaking at local community groups, speaking at schools. And when you have more than one grab in the media, yeah. right, um, you can actually explain to people in the community who's actually criminalised and imprisoned. And when they understand that absolutely, they just go, this is not the answer. Um, this is not the answer, but it's about, you know, we are in the law, we have been in the law, law and order campaign that's come from the US for decades. Um, it's taken its bite and it's taking a big its bite and it's got its grip now where we're just, the numbers are going up and um, we actually have to stop it because we know that crime rates are down. Um, crime rates are not up. And when you tell people that, they're like, what? Yes, because yes. it's what they're fed in the media and by politicians on that three-year cycle or four-year cycle. That's why I talk about courageous leadership. The government's got to be create, courageous and do something different here now um, to change, to ship, to steer the ship or the sinking Titanic or rip it out like and move it in another direction. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting here in another decade. I've been involved in this system as a 13-year-old child onwards, so over... 45 years and nothing is different. I go to those youth prisons, they're exactly the same when I was there. I go to the adult prison, they're exactly the same. What's different is the mass amount of numbers. You guys are making a difference though. It is different. I mean, Sisters Inside exists and you are doing good. But women, thank you for that, but women have to be criminalised and imprisoned. I, I want to be yeah. out of a job, not in a job. And so that's why the, the thing, the other things that I've been thinking about and I think a lot about strategies of how to deal this is um, I've come up with this model and, and I need to do some more thinking about it to get the nuts and bolts is like a women's centre. So where women don't get criminalised. So if there's homeless women, for example, and collide with the police on the street, um, instead of them being taken to the watch house, could be taken to a women's centre where they're supported and then um, brokerage money could be used to you know, buy in accommodation so they're safe and then the ongoing supports happen. So then that actually stops women coming into the system absolutely in the first instance. The part of that model which I'm still grappling is it means that the police have to make the call if they've come in contact with Mary to bring Mary to the um, mm. community, uh, to the women's centre. In smaller communities it would be easier because people could refer or Mary would know about it if it's in a small that's Aboriginal right. community because they know that that's there, it's a place they can come to for support. But in, you know, in Brisbane, bigger cities, you can't get the word out and then it's up to the discretion of the police. And we all you know, we know absolutely when it comes to the women that are criminalised in prison that we know, the police always take the negative view, they never take a positive view and they're taken to the watch house and uh, left in there and then to be dealt with the, you know, the criminal legal system and off they go. Just wanted to, um, Deb, tease out what you've said about, and it's off track what, what, you, what you've just talked sure. about now, but I, I want for you to tease it out a bit more. 
you mentioned fines based on women's income. Mm. So I just want to hear around some of your thoughts around that. It's the first time I've heard that. Mm. Um, so I want to I want to hear sure. a bit more about what your thinking is around that. Is that more around than just standard fines set? Yeah, amounts? standard fines for everybody. So you know, if um, if you're earning a hundred thousand dollars a year and you get a traffic ticket, well, then it's in the equation of that amount that you earn. If you are on New Start, two hundred and sixty dollars a week and you get a traffic fine, well then that actually needs to be in line with that amount of income. So it would be like a sliding scale. Um, so we need to look at the fine system instead of yeah. having this amount of fine for absolutely everybody because that actually creates, continues the inequalities and ensures the entrenched poverty for the most marginalised and disadvantaged women. Yeah, because we've heard in just moving around, we've heard you know people talk about how they're their son or their daughter or their sister or their brother or their mother or father um, has in fact incurred lots of fines and then the inability to pay the fines based on yes. because they're on either New Start or yeah. an aged pension or a disability pension. Yeah. And, the other and issue even though they want to pay it back and they sure. try to, they get themselves into yeah. trouble for non-payment. Yeah, and spurs an issue in the sense where, um, you know, I don't know if you know, but um, we've been running a campaign in Western Australia because the law there is if yeah. you get a fine and you don't pay it, a warrant is issued, court fines, and you go directly to prison. You don't pass go, that's where you go. So we've, um, you know, over three months have raised over $400,000 and have paid uh, about 133 Aboriginal women's uh, warrants and released 11 women from prison um, because the prison rings us when the women come in on remand and we pay them immediately for her to be released. And just doing that has made a massive change in women's lives by re relieving them of that debt because of poverty. Now here what we have the fines are, you know, um, sent to SPUR, referred to SPUR. However, there's a group of faceless bureaucrats that can make a decision to issue a warrant, which we absolutely oppose. Um, Western Australian Government is uh, tabling a bill to change their laws around the warrants and fines by the 27th of July. And one, one of the areas in the bill is, is that if a warrant was ever going to be issued, um, it must go back to a judicial officer. And that's what we must see here. So instead of um, having the entrenched poverty continue over and over again like the people that you're talking about that well one if the, if the department makes a recommendation to issue a warrant that it must go to a, a magistrate and to be heard and that person comes and makes submissions the other thing they're doing which i think we need to do as well you can do it but it's a bit sneaky and behind the scenes here like it's not everyone doesn't know about it i would say is about the hardship hey so we've been working, we've got law students working to assist individual women to actually make submissions to SPUR to have their debts either wiped or reduced because of hardship um, because they are on new start. But that's going to be, that's like a woman one by one by one where we actually need to look at the system and how it ha actually continues with the entrenched inequalities. Um, and, and I think just to add to that, the other um, sort of um, enforcement measures that SPUR can take, including things like suspending your driver's mm. licence or garnishing um, funds from your bank account, are also really, um, you know, obviously contribute to people's criminalisation or contribute to people's inability to sort of take, you know, pro proactive or positive steps um, to get out of that debt or navigate that system. Marissa, so, we've, yeah. we've talked to SPUR. I think. Yeah. On some issues, they'd be aligned with your thinking. Mm. On other mm. issues, they do have fairly broad powers and they're exercising a wide range or using a wide range of tools to collect that debt on mm. behalf of the state. Um, I, I think they're more aligned than unaligned, so it's, you know, don't give up on this one. <laughs> well, you put it in your report. No doubt we will. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm going to draw this session presentation to a close um, and thank you, Marissa. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Please.